everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dan Alden and Senior Pastor of Reality Church here in Perth, Western Australia. And I'm so glad you've joined us to get a hold of this week's message. I really believe God wants to do something fresh and powerful in your life. And I'm praying that this message you're about to hear will be a catalyst for that. So enjoy the message. And remember, Jesus is the reality you've been looking for. Hey, today we're super excited because we are starting a brand new series called Pit Stop. Somebody say Pit Stop. You know, a couple of months ago, or maybe a year ago now, I was watching a Netflix series about Formula One. We got any F1 fans in the house today? We got a couple of diehard fans here. They know everyone. They, they watch it. They stay up late, get up early, whatever. And I was watching this really cool um, doco on Netflix, a series about Formula One. And I don't really know much about Formula One, so I was learning all about it, learning all about our boy Daniel Ricciardo from Perth, who's one of the heroes in the, in the, in the F1 series. And anyone fans of Daniel Ricciardo? Oh, we've got a couple. <laughs> and um, I was learning all about it. But one thing that fascinated me was, was the pit stop. It just fascinated me because here you've got these guys racing as hard as they possibly can, pushing their car to the absolute limit, sometimes out in front of others, but then there comes this moment where no matter where they're at in the race, they have to pull in for a pit stop. And you can almost sense the frustration of the driver who's like, man, if only I didn't have to stop for a pit stop, I could just keep going. I could just maintain this lead, this five second lead, this two car lead, whatever. But there's this moment where everybody on the track has to pull in for a scheduled pit stop. Otherwise, they risk not making it to the end of the race. And sometimes we can feel like we're out in front. We're doing good. We're pushing ahead. We're getting some wins. God's blessing us. We're seeing God's favor. We're seeing some breakthroughs. Man, I'm just going to keep running. I'm going to keep going hard. Sometimes we feel like we've got things on the momentum happening in our life. But there's always a moment when God calls us in for a pit stop, no matter how well we're doing. You know, it doesn't matter if you're winning the race by a lap, you still got to pull in for a pit stop at some point. And I learned that the pit stop was actually a crucial part of the race. In fact, the race is actually won, not just on how good the drivers are, but how good the pit crew is too. Because you can have Daniel Ricciardo driving in first place, but if he has a rubbish pit crew... It could all fall apart in a moment, which actually happened to him multiple times in 2016. He pulled in to his scheduled pit stop. He was being called in on the radio. Okay, Daniel, pull in next lap. Come in. We're ready for you. We're ready to go. It's time for a pit stop. He was in the lead by a decent amount and he pulled in for a pit stop. And guess what? His pit crew weren't ready for him. Oh man. I mean, these guys have got one job, right? There's like 20 of them. They work together. They got four tires to put on. <laughs> they're, they're supposed to be standing by. They're supposed to be working as a team. But for some reason, there was a lack of communication. Somebody was out of sync. They pulled, he pulled in for his pit stop. They took way too long. And when he pulled out on the track, his opponent snuck ahead of him and he didn't win the race. Now, here, here, here's the point. The point that I'm trying to make is that our pit crew and our pit stop is just as important as how well we're doing in any area of our life. Are you with me? And so we want to do a series about pit stop because I believe that no matter how well we're doing in our family life, our walk with God, our business, our relationships, our finances, whatever it is that's going on in our life, no matter how well we're doing, we all need a scheduled pit stop to make sure that we keep going and can keep doing well. And so that's what this series is about. You know, I found out that in a pit stop, there's a there's a bunch of things going on. I read something from um, F1 for Dummies. So if you, if you want to check it out, it's online. But it's interesting that when, when, when the racer goes out, there's actually a race strategy. There's actually a strategy about on what laps they will take a pit stop. It's not just kind of random and like, oh man, I'm seeing the red line on my fuel tank. Guys, are you ready for a pit stop? Like, I'm coming in hot. I don't even know if I'm going to make it. Quick, get the tires ready. Or, 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 you know, they've been lapping around and then all of a sudden the tires are half ripping apart. So they're like, guys, I need a pit stop. No, no, no. It's actually a scheduled pit stop. How many people know that? 
It's, it's pre-decided. It's a strategy. They've already strategized about when the pit stop should be, which tells me that in our lives, we can't just wait for moments where we feel like, man, I'm about to break down. I need some work done. We, we actually need to schedule ahead and say, you know what? When I'm running hot and I'm running great, that's when I'm going to go for a pit stop. When I'm at a point of strength, that's the point when I'm going to pull in for my pit stop out of a pre-decided discipline, not because I feel like I need it right now. Because I can tell you when Daniel Ricciardo is out in front and he knows he's got the lead, the last thing he wants to do is pull in for a pit stop. Are you with me? He just wants to keep fanging it all the way home. But he knows if he does that, he's probably going to crash out right before the finish. And we want to be people that finish the race for Jesus. Amen. I want to be a father who finishes raising my kids right till they go off to become young men. I want to be a man who finishes being married to my wife right until the day that I leave this planet to be with Jesus. I want to be a man who finishes the call of God on my life. Come on, somebody. I don't want to bow out when the pressure's on. I want to fall over and crash out and burn. And the only way that we're going to be able to do that is if we, if we pre-design, pre-schedule pit stops in our life, in key areas of our life, so that we can keep running at full potential with maximum power and momentum and speed. Amen? How many people think that sounds like good preaching right there? And so they've got a race strategy. The pit stop is called by the, in the previous lap. Now, I think it's really good that in our life we, we set up people who are part of our pit crew. And I want you to think about through this series, who, as we hear about the different things that God wants to work on, who's my pit crew? Who's in my team that knows me, that understands how I run in life, that understands my, my, my lap style, my, my, the way I drive my life, who can help me remember when my pit stops are? Hey, on the radio, okay, Daniel, it's time for your pit stop. And we need good people in our life to remind us and to hold us accountable to a pit stop because sometimes we want to just keep going. <laughs> I think we've all done that before. And when they come into the pit stop, there's a couple of things that happens is firstly, they get refueled. And I don't know, I know there's some just, maybe there's some new tech and some cars now have enough fuel for the whole race. I don't know, it depends on how long the race is. But traditionally, all right, traditionally, they get refueled in the pit stop because they're burning fuel at high, high, high capacity. These cars are running hot. They come in, they get refueled. They get their old wheels off, their new wheels on. Guess what? The visor on their helmet gets cleaned and, and washed by somebody. Because how many people know that when you're running, your vision can get blurry? Sometimes bugs can splatter and land on your windscreen. And so they get their, their vision cleaned up and... There's a lollipop man who holds a big lollipop, you know, like the, side, the circle on the end of the stick, in front of them that says, brakes on. There's somebody there at the pit stop to say, hey, you need to take a moment to stop. This isn't just a slow down moment. This is a stop moment. Every now and again, we need to stop in every area of our life and just take stock. We need to get our fuel refueled. Amen. We need to get our tires changed. We need, to, we need to get something fresh happening in our walking and in our what, the, what we've been running on. We need it to be upgraded because things wear out. And we need our vision cleared up. And so through this series, we're going we're gonna to hit into some different areas of life that are going to speak to different things. We're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about having a healthy spirit and a strong spirit in God. Because out of our spirit, out of our inner man is where our life flows from. We're going to talk about having a healthy soul and emotions. We're going to talk about having... What other ones we got? I've just gone blank. Healthy marriage, healthy rest, healthy body, healthy pocket, finances. We're going we're gonna to hit through a lot of areas of our life because how many people know at the pit stop, they don't just change the tires. They don't just clean the windscreen. They don't just put fuel in the tank. There's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on and there's a whole bunch of people working on it. And so this series, we've got some great people speaking. And I believe in this series, we're going to be encouraged to set up and design our life with pit stops in mind. We're going to take a pit stop in this series, but we're also going to learn how to design our life with scheduled pit stops so we can run on full capacity in Jesus' mighty name. Are you ready for it? So good. Hey, I wanted to start today by looking at having a healthy spirit because really when it comes down to it, we are a three-part being where we are actually a spirit. And we have a soul and we live in a body. And often we spend a lot of our life thinking about our body. This is probably where we spend the most part of our time when, we, when we're thinking about self-care, looking after ourselves. 
or maybe not. Maybe we just eat absolute rubbish all the time. And, but we, we think about our body, and I think there's an emphasis on that, and we're going to talk about that in the series. We talk about our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, but we also have a spirit to take care of and to bring in for a pit stop because God wants to make our spirits healthy and strong. Amen? And God wants to give us strength in our spirit, man, for all that is ahead. Because really, how we are in our spirit actually affects all of our life. And I wanted to start by reading 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Not the whole chapter, so don't worry. But we're going to go to verse 8. This is Paul speaking. Paul was a man that was running hard for God. He was racing on the track of the ministry God had called him to. He was... He was winning some incredible, incredible races for God and taking the gospel to places it had never been before. But along the way, he'd been experiencing a whole bunch of battering and beating and conflicts and pressure and all of the kinds of things that you go through in life. How many people have watched a Formula One race and you've seen sometimes those cars collide and the whole front plastic parts will fly off. Sometimes wheels will smash and wobble. And, you know, it, it, can, be a, it can be a war zone out on the track. And how many people know that life can feel like a war zone sometimes? You feel like you're just up against it in your work week. People at your workplace, it's like, man, I'm going into a battlefield. Sometimes you can just feel like when you get a few things happening, then something crazy will happen. And it's like, this is going great. But all of a sudden now I've got a drama going on over here. People's opinions about you, conversations we have. Spiritual darkness comes against our life. We live in a we live in a natural realm, but there is a spiritual realm and there is real things going on in the realm of the spirit. And we have a real enemy who we don't see with our physical eyes, who's out there. And here's Paul and he's sort of talking about his ministry and some of the things he's experienced in life. And he's saying in verse 8, We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. Somebody say that's good news. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are Hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. And this is why we never give up in verse 16. He says, even though I've been through all of this, here's the secret, here's the reason I don't give up. Though our outward, our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. He said, though my body's getting beaten around, though there's pressure, there's external stuff coming against me, though I face troubles and torments and sometimes I get knocked down he said here's why I never give up because no matter what's going on around me there's something uh, there's something incredible going on on the inside of me called my spirit man being renewed and strengthened and revived how often day by day you see I know that we face trouble sometimes and we can face despair sometimes and be perplexed sometimes and abandoned sometimes and feel like we've been knocked down sometimes. But Paul's like, what I need for to be able to face those sometimes is I need an every time in my life, which is every day. And he says, every day my spirit is being renewed and strengthened. This is an amazing insight because Paul, who did so much for God, who experienced so much opposition for God, the kind of thing that you would make you want to give up. Hey, if I'm being treated like, like that, I'm just, you know, everything within me. I know you've probably had moments in life where you're like, you know what, I just want to quit on this. Man, today being a parent is just way too hard. I just want to give up. I'm just ready to walk out on this, man. Man, I've had moments like that. You know what? This marriage is just feeling way too hard. I just can't take the pressure. We're arguing. We don't agree with each other. She can't understand me. He can't understand me. You know what? I just feel like quitting on this thing. I know there's people that have been there before. I know there's people where you've been in situations where you've been misunderstood and people haven't really got you and, and you feel like you feel excluded because you don't feel like you're understood by others and we can feel like we want to give up on the job. We want to give up on what we're called to do. But Paul was like that many times, but he said the reason he didn't give up is because his spirit, his spirit was being renewed day by day. I love how the, tra the new oh, passion, TPT, puts it. That was just a weird mumble up of translations right there. I love how the Passion puts it. It says, So no wonder we don't give up, for even though our outer person gradually wears out, our inner being is renewed every single day. Here, here's something that I think we need to talk about. How's our inner world going? How's, how's our spirit man going? There's another translation that says our outer man is dying, but our inner man 
is being renewed day by day. Did you know that you have an inner man on the inside of you? And when you came to Christ and when you accepted Jesus, you became born again and the inner man of your life came alive in Christ and you became a living new creation with Jesus. It's called spirit life. It was given to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our spirit man came alive in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we were once dead in sin, but when we came to Christ, we became alive in Christ. And we have a spirit man. We have an inner man on the inside of us. And God wants to strengthen and build up that inner man to be strong, to, be, have, to have backbone, to actually lead the way for the rest of our life. So that every other part of our life will follow and, and be lived out of the strength of our inner man rather than just the strength of our outer man. And this is what Paul was saying, that he'd learned how to, how to see that inner man renewed and strengthened and how to live out of that place so that no matter what was going on around him, he had a strength to pull upon that was from the invisible realm. And people were like, how is this guy still standing? We knocked you down like a hundred times. Why are you coming back into our city? <laughs> we chased you out. We whipped you. We put you in prison. Why are you still here? He's like, I've got some inner man strength that you don't know about. You guys don't know what I'm talking about because you don't know Jesus, but I know Jesus and I have a strength in me that's not of this world. I have a life on the inside of me that's not from this world. It didn't come from the gym. It didn't come from what I ate in the natural. It came from my spirit and it helped me stand through the toughest of situations. But you know what? Spiritual strength doesn't come from just saying, hey, Jesus, I believe in you, let's go. It actually comes through a relationship with Jesus that's developed daily. I love how Paul says it's renewed, this life, this spirit man is renewed day by day. And so I want to talk about strengthening our spirit man. And I want to talk about two things today. Firstly, I want to talk about fresh word. And then I want to talk about fresh fire. Are you with me today, church? Somebody say fresh word, fresh fire. Fresh word, fresh fire. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 4. We're going to see Jesus giving us insight into how he was thriving in a situation that most of us would be dead in. It'd be like Paul. When he thought he should be given up by now, there was something going on beneath the surface that provided incredible strength. Here's, here's Jesus in Matthew 4. In verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. How many people have ever imagined that the Holy Spirit would lead you to a place like that? <laughs> I thought the Holy Spirit was just going to lead me to like, you know, the, the blessing and the, and the favor and like the, 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 the God-ordained moments. But here's the Holy Spirit leading Jesus into the wilderness. To be tempted by the devil. That sounds crazy. And for 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. Another translation says he became extremely weak and famished. Anyone ever felt extremely weak and famished before? I felt like that yesterday, to be honest. I had such a big week. I, to this week, I went back to school and I started Bible college, um, a graduate civic of leadership and just like something I've never done before, like university level of study and teaching. And I'm just like, man, this is just crazy. It was an intensive week. I was in school all week long and my, just about exploded my brain and my fingers for all the typing I was doing. And I was like, man, I think I want to quit and give up. Like, I don't know if I can do these assignments and essays. And man, I came to the end of the week and I felt extremely weak and famished. <laughs> Physically, but, you know, strengthened on the inside. Here's Jesus, let's just, let's just look at this for a second. Here's Jesus in a tough situation. How many people have been in a tough situation before? Just let me see your hand. How many people have been in a tough situation? For everyone else, can you pray for me later? You, if you've never been in a tough situation, I need, I need that wisdom. I need to know how to avoid tough situations. But if you're like me, you've been in a tough situation once or twice, you'll know that those situations can be extremely taxing on you. Here's Jesus in the wilderness, and the closest thing I can picture this to is when I was in Dubai a few years ago, and uh, here's me and Eli kicking it in Dubai, and uh, 
You see, I was in my desert attire and um, <laughs> Eli was pretty much just Instagramming live the whole time like, oh my goodness, look at this camel, you know, full Insta life. And um, I remember being out here and just going, man, this is insane. Like there is just vastness, barrenness. There's like, you know, probably a scorpion and stuff like slithering along somewhere. There's just like, this is barren land. And this is the kind of place that Jesus was. He was in the wilderness and he was in a dry place and he was in a tough situation. 40 days and 40 nights, he had no food and he became very hungry. And during this time, the devil came to tempt him and the devil started testing Jesus and really trying to break Jesus. You know, it's in these moments when we face a tough situation that the enemy can try to break us and try to take us off the track for good, try to take us out of the race. But Jesus had a greater strength going on that the devil didn't know about. And the devil said, hey, Jesus, you're in this, you're in this situation. Why don't you turn the stones into bread? Why don't you just command these stones to become bread and feed your, your hunger, feed, satisfy your starvation? Have you ever found that you're in a moment of a tough situation, you're feeling exhausted, and the enemy will come and, and tempt us to try to take stones and turn them into bread, to try to take things that can never nourish you and paint the illusion upon them that they could somehow nourish your life if you were to partake. This is where temptation comes. This is where we can fall into sin. This is where we can fall into feeding our flesh or finding an escape or finding a way out. But in this moment, Jesus speaks to the devil and he says, Hey devil, I've got to tell you something. People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Somebody say fresh word. See, Jesus had un understood this reality that strength in life does not come by just having great situations and circumstances around us. It comes by having a fresh word on the inside of our spirit. And he said, we don't live by bread alone. We don't live by what's in the physical, tangible realm alone. We actually live by the word of God that sustains us deep within our spirit, man, and makes us strong and makes us alive and gives us the ability to bounce back in tough situations. It gives us the ability to stand even when everything around us is going crazy. And we're in a wilderness maybe experience or in a desert or in a tough situation. Jesus said, I don't live out of that realm. I live out of this realm. I live out of a different realm. And I live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. See, Jesus was actually quoting the written word in this moment. He was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, that literally says what Jesus just said. And so it shows us two things. First of all, that Jesus had the written word on the inside of him and he could draw upon it at moments of trial and moments of testing and moments that he needed it. But it also showed us that in, in, in Jesus saying that the word that proceeds, that's proceeding from the mouth of God, listen to how the Passion Translation puts it. It says, he answered the scriptures say, bread alone will not satisfy, but true life, somebody say true life, is found in every word which constantly goes forth from God's mouth. Constantly goes forth from God's mouth. I believe that God is always speaking. I believe that God is still speaking today. That He hasn't stopped speaking, you know, since, since the Bible was finished being written, that He's still speaking by His Spirit and through His Word to us every single day. Now, everything that God speaks is going, to, is going to back up things that He's already said because God isn't schizophrenic and He's not going to change His, His mind. But what God has said can also provide a platform for what God is saying today. See, Jesus took Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 that was living in Him, that He'd fed upon at some point, He'd read. Now the Holy Spirit's turning it into revelation for Him that in this moment, that word is life to Him. And in this moment, he doesn't need to rely upon things in the natural because he's got a word from God that's sustaining him in his spirit. I believe that to be strong in spirit, we need to feed our spirit on the word of God. Now, I know that might sound simple. That might sound elementary for us as Christians, but 
there's a fresh word for you and for me every single day. I'm not just talking about head knowledge of the word. I'm not just talking about, oh, I did my reading plan, which is great. We need those. But I'm talking about reading the Bible and saying, God, I need to hear from you today because I don't know what I'm about to face. But I know that if I've got a word from you, God, that whatever I face or whatever I'm facing, I will have the strength to face it and overcome it because I've got a word from heaven. Because I know that I can't live by bread alone, by situations alone, by things in the natural, but by the very words that God is speaking. And Jesus is here sustained after 40 days of fasting. <laughs> Man, I'd be dying. I'm dying after a few days of fasting. I don't know about you. Anyone here ever done a 40 day fast? Oh, one person. That's incredible. A couple of people. That's amazing. Fasting, like it's incredibly taxing on the body. Jesus did 40 days and he was hanging out in the desert. He wasn't like 40 days with, you know, um, fresh juices on this side. We've got Milo's here. He's got like all the electrolytes and stuff that you could want. I mean, every single beverage on the planet with every replenishing substance and, and, and his bedroom and air conditioning and, you know, music to put on to motivate him and preaching to listen to when he's feeling like giving up. No, Jesus in the desert. Now, are you with me? Like he's sleeping on the sand. He's got sand up his nose. He's got sand in his ears, in his beard. He's like, oh man, this sand is doing my hair crazy. He's going through sandstorms. I mean, he's in a tough situation. But he's got something tougher on the inside of him. It's called the living, breathing word of God. Let's check out Hebrews 4. It says, for we have the living word of God, which is full of energy like a two-edged or a two-mouthed sword, it will even penetrate to the very core of our being. See, where does, the, where does the word reach? Where does the word of God reach? It doesn't just reach our mind. It doesn't just reach our thoughts. It actually reaches the very core of our being. Amen? And what does it do? It gives life and it feeds and strengthens our spirit man. Our inner man is strengthened. It, it, makes, it brings fresh vitality. It energizes because it's full of energy, the Bible says. And it penetrates to the very core of our being where soul and spirit, bone and marrow meet. Isn't that awesome? I love this. It interprets and reveals the true thoughts and secret motives of our heart. You know what I've found is that when we read God's Word and we, we, we're actually expecting God to speak to us, that as we read God's Word with that kind of approach, His Word actually reads us. And I want to encourage you to come to the Word and say, God, I'm not just reading your Word. I want your Word to read me. I want your Word to read me, God. I want your Word to read my thoughts and intents and, and do a deep work in my life and, and energize me in my inner man and renew my inner man with the living Word of God. Say this with me. God's Word is alive. God's Word is alive. It's not just a history book. It's not a book full of just what we should do. It's not just the account of what happened to Christ. It is actually living, full of energy, full of power, full of life. And when we get it in our spirit, it renews our spirit. It strengthens our spirit. It encourages our spirit. Are you with me? And it gives us a place to live from that no matter what we're facing, we have the strength. And so I want to encourage us, I want to call us to get fresh word. Hey, the good thing is you don't have to hear me preach to get a fresh word because the Holy Spirit is with you, partnering with you as you read the word, as we read together, He gives us a fresh word. You know, I was, I was, I was struggling with something just the other day and I opened my Bible and I, I started reading a passage and I was looking for something else. But as I was looking for something else, I read the previous verses and God spoke to me from those verses into that very situation, into that very moment of that very day. Somebody say fresh word. God has a fresh word for you. He has a fresh word for me. And instead of living by bread alone, let's begin to live by every word that's proceeding from the mouth of God. Amen? Go after it. Let's go hungry for it. Because it'll make our spirit and our inner man so, so strong as we live off the word that comes from God. 
So we talked about a fresh word. Let's talk about fresh fire. We're going to go to Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Somebody say fresh fire. See, what I've found is that a spirit that's strong is a spirit that has fresh word and a spirit that has fresh fire. John 3, Luke 3.16 this is John the Baptist speaking to people who were talking to him about whether he was the Christ, what was he up to with baptizing people. They were, they were quizzing him, interviewing him about his role, his ministry. Who are you? He said this, I baptize with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. So much greater that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with, somebody say it. And with, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Let's just be clear. John the Baptist was pointing to Jesus. He's saying, hey guys, I'm baptizing you in water, but there's someone coming after me who is greater than me. And when he comes, he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. I don't know if that's exciting for you today or not, but let me just tell you something. When I met Jesus and I started following Him and I heard about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. I wanted it. I wanted it because people that carried it, there was something about it that intrigued me. When I heard people praying in this other language called tongues, I was like, I'm, I want to know about this. Something about this is, is intriguing to me. It's drawing upon something within me. I've I, I got to find out about it. So I studied the Bible. I studied, I studied the New Testament about the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we don't have time to go into all of that today. But I came to the conclusion that yes, Jesus wanted to give me that same baptism that He gave the 120 in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And the fire came. And as they spoke, as they prayed tongues of fire, somebody say fire. Fire came down upon them and it turned people who were, who were shy, who were timid, who were fearful and afraid, who were hiding in an upper room for fear of, of the Jew, of the Romans and they didn't know what to do with what Jesus had called them to do but they're there, they're just waiting and all of a sudden you see somebody like Peter who was, who was denying Jesus only a few months before all of a sudden steps out with the fire, somebody say fire, he stepped out with the fire and boldness of God and preached to 5,000 people plus and saw a move of God and saw the church begin. And when I got hungry for this, I went up and I asked to be prayed for and I had faith and I believed that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was for me. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I didn't just receive the Holy Spirit. I also received fire. And all of a sudden, my life was set on fire for the gospel. My life was set on fire for God. My heart was set on fire for more of Him. And all of a sudden, I had a hunger for the presence of God like I'd never had before. All I can, all I can say is I, had, I got the fire. I can't really explain it to you. It's not something you can just punt, you know, sit down and do a three-part course. I had a hunger. I asked the Holy Spirit to fill me, and He did, and I got the fire. Now I know here today, we've got a mixed room. We've got some people that have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and know what I'm talking about. And we have some people in the room that have never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you're like, that sounds cool, but I've never experienced that. I know that's what's in this room today. And today, my call is to say, for those that know the fire, God wants to give you fresh fire. And for those who don't, God wants to give you first fire and then fresh fire. Are you with me, church? Because you know what? If the disciples needed fire to build the church and to get the gospel out, how much more do we need fire in our day and age? If the disciples were told by Jesus, don't even start ministry until I give you the fire, then how much more do we need the fire in the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Leviticus 6, and I want to finish with this passage today. But what I've found is that strength of spirit, health of spirit life, inner life, inner man, my inner man grows in stature and strength and boldness when I'm filled with fresh word and when I'm filled with fresh fire. Now I want to show you something in Leviticus chapter 6 right now. This is so powerful and, I, and we're going to pull from an Old Testament passage through, through 
the lens of the Holy Spirit and see what it can mean for us today. Because how many people know that God speaks, He breathes upon the Old Testament Scriptures and gives them new and fresh meaning through Jesus and through salvation and in light of the Gospel. And, and the Bible says here that God was commanding them about the fire on the altar. We're talking about the tabernacle. We're talking about the tent of meeting. There's an altar where the sacrifices are put. And He's instructing them, Moses, about how they have to take care of the fire Somebody say, I've got to take care of the fire. Meanwhile, the fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must never go out. Well, here's a first lesson for us. How many people know that if you're driving a Formula One race car around a track trying to win, the fuel tank must never be empty? Are you with me, church? The fuel tank must never be empty. For the Christian, the fire must never go out. Check this out. Each morning, the priest will add fresh wood to the fire and arrange the burnt offering on it. And he will then burn the fat of the peace offerings on it. Remember, the fire must be kept burning on the altar at all times. It must never go out. Must never go out. Now, I just want to say... I believe in the grace of God. My salvation, your salvation, our right standing with God is based upon His grace, not upon our works, not upon how many hours we pray, not upon how many chapters we read. It's a gift given to us. But let me tell you, if I want a strong spirit, if I want an inner man that can rise up and fulfill all that God has for my life, if I want to run the track over and over and fire on all cylinders, come on somebody, and head for the finish line in my life, I need the fire of God on the inside of me to burn hot. And I can be completely honest, I've been through seasons where I've had the fire burning. I've been through seasons where I've let the fire smolder down to a coal. I've been through seasons in my life where I haven't tended to the fire of God in my life. And I've kept going through the motions. I've kept my foot on the accelerator. I've kept my hand on the wheel. Come on, somebody. I've kept those tires burning around the track. But there's come moments where I've gone like, the fire's not burning in the back, in the motor for some reason. And when I've stopped to check in a pit stop moment, I've realized the tank's a little empty. The tank is needing some fresh word in it, and the tank is needing some fresh fire. Are you with me? Some fuel for the fire. See, what makes fire burn is fuel. And we see here in this passage that the priest was responsible for adding fresh wood to the fire every single morning. Hello, priests of the Most High God. How many people know that I'm not your priest? Pastor Brooke isn't your priest. You are a priest to the Most High God. Jesus has made us a kingdom of priests. He's actually called all of us to have this priestly ministry. He's our high priest, but we are all the priests that get to minister to the Lord and minister to others. And here's the call that each morning the priest would add fresh wood to the fire and arrange the burnt offering on it. Here's what I've found that as I've followed Jesus, He's called me to be the offering on the fire. Romans 12 verse 1, it says, I I call to you, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You and I are the offering on the altar. And every morning, the priest was called to get fresh wood, fresh word, put it on the fire. Then rearrange the offering. Get the offering and set it in place. Because you know what? We're a living sacrifice and we wriggle on the altar a lot. Are you with me? How many people have like been on the altar, lay my life down for you, Jesus, and then like the next morning I've somehow rolled off the altar and I'm over here now and the fire's over there and I'm kind of like over here, but then you come to a pit stop, a prayer meeting, a service, something, oh yeah, like get back on the altar. So what God's calling us to do is actually every day rearrange our life on the altar, get some fresh wood in, get in the presence of God and say, God, let the fresh fire come and consume this offering. Because guess what? The fire isn't there just for fire's sake. The fire is there to burn the offering. Are you with me, church? 
And the Bible says here that when the fire is burning, it will burn the fat. I don't know about you, but I've found that every day I kind of pick up fat into my life. <laughs> Hopefully not in my, um, you know, anyway. I've been losing a little bit lately. I don't know if you've seen. <laughs> the fire's been burning it away. No. Um, we could pick up stuff, hey? We pick up attitudes. We pick up stuff as, along the way. But guess what the fire does? The fire burns it away. How often? Every morning. Here's my encouragement today. Is that a healthy spirit, a strong spirit on the inside, that inner man is strong, energized when the fire is burning hot, when the word is fresh. When the word is fresh and the fire is hot, we have a vitality that could go the distance. We can go through trial. We can go through wilderness. We can go through pressure. We can go through circumstances. Why? Because there's something on the inside. There's a healthy, strong spirit, man. So what does it look like to get on the altar? Every morning. Yeah, I'm not going to be religious and say that you have to pray every morning. But what I've found is that as the day goes on, more and more stuff comes my way. More and more thoughts, lies from the enemy, situations. It'd be really helpful to start the day with fresh word and fresh fire, don't you reckon? So I want to encourage us. How can we make that happen? God's not going to be mad at you if you don't. But hey, you might not be mad at someone else if you do. Are you with me, church? When we're burning for Him. This is a moment with God where it's not about a to-do list and it's not about, God, I've got five things I'm trusting you for. That's great. I love that. Man, I'm, I'm asking God through the whole day, God, I need you to do this. Father, I need you to do this. God, I need you to provide over here. Oh, Lord, would you heal this person I just heard? Was I don't, I don't necessarily need to have a moment with God for that. That's great. But there's this moment where we come before the Father and we say, God, I give you my life. I put myself on the altar. God, I need fresh fire. God, I need to hear from you. God, I need you to speak to me. And when we pray and we pray in the Spirit and we seek the Lord in His presence, there's these moments where He lights us up with fresh fire and where He re-energizes us deep within. Are you with me? And this is the place where I want to call the pit stop to begin is in that moment with God to have fresh word and fresh fire in our tank, ready to burn strong, to go another lap, to go another lap. Are you with me, church? To keep going for God, to go strong for God, to be powerful for God, to be bold for Him. Well, hey, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. We trust that God is doing something incredible in your life. And if you'd like to find out more about Reality Church or you want to find out more about having a relationship with God, head over to our website, myreality.church, and you can find out everything there. If you're in Perth, we would love to meet you. So come join us at a service on a Sunday. You can find all the details at our website, myreality.church. We hope to see you soon.